In December of 1911, a group of Norwegian and Swedish homesteaders formed a Scandinavian Lutheran church in the town of Boxelder, Montana. The congregation met in local homes for several years until they finally laid the cornerstone of Faith Lutheran Church in 1917. Like many other small towns in central and eastern Montana, the people of Faith Lutheran witnessed the steady demise of the once prosperous community because of a deficiency of economic growth, and in October of 2005, Lack of membership forced the people of Faith Lutheran to close their doors. Initially, European immigrants came in droves to the Montana Plains with idealized dreams of economic opportunity. They came hard on the heels of rumors about fertile land, rich minerals, and animals for trapping. First, it was fur. People came out in the 1820s and 30s because of the potential of fur-bearing animals in the rivers. In the 1850s and 60s and 70s and 80s, in the 90s, it was minerals that brought people out, uh, and by the 1880s, we had a transcontinental railroad cutting across Montana, the Northern Pacific, and so that made it a lot easier for people to come out. By the 1890s and the early 1900s, a lot of land was made available to Montanans in the form of um, homesteads. In 1909, Congress passed a law at the behest of a lot of Western congressmen, uh, senators particularly, including our own Joseph Dixon, called the Enlarged Homestead Act. And that doubled the amount of land that could be homestead in the American West. In a dry place like Montana, people just couldn't make it on 160 acres, so they expanded it to 320. And what a lot of folks did was they came out and filed claims on their 320, and then, you know, brother or uncle or some relative would file claim on an adjacent 320, or one that was uh, caddy corner. and Ultimately, over time, the goal was to incorporate all of these homestead 320 blocks into pretty big spreads, and you could make money off of essentially dry land farming. In fact, railroad companies went over to Europe, recruited people in Norway, Scandinavian countries. Um, in their own language, they'd create pamphlets to, you know, in their, in their vernacular to come on out and they sold Montana as a kind of a Garden of Eden, Ooh, kind of false advertising. I mean, Homestead, all you have to do is put a filing fee on it and pay the taxes on it and after five years, if you've, if you've quote unquote proved it up, it's yours. And for a lot of Americans, the vast majority of Americans, this was way out of the realm of possibility. But this was the American dream of land ownership and it could be had at a pretty cheap price if you were willing to endure the hardship of doing that. And for a lot of people who had no skills in farming at all, it was, you know, it was a huge adventure. And ultimately for a lot of them too, it was a colossal failure because when the drought comes, what do you do? I mean, it was just, it's kind of a tragedy. In this particular case, there were some squatters that were sitting on this land uh, as early as 1888, probably feeding the Fort Assiniboine. Uh, which was just on the uh, just up by Haver, uh, and uh, they were uh, providing services to Fort Assiniboine. So there were four squatters in the Box Elder area. There was a colony of uh, people that are, uh, tried to make a go of it in 1889, uh, trying to capitalize on basically unsettled land. Land had a tremendous meaning to people. The ability to own land, uh, even if you had to work hard at it out here in the American West, uh, provide a great incentive to move out here. Uh, in this particular um, region in Box Elder, they first made a go of it in 1889. A colony led by John Bremer uh, came and tried to make a town, but it, it more or less withered away primarily due to lack of water. Uh, there's uh, dryland farming really hadn't taken root as, uh, and been developed as well as it as it ultimately will be uh, uh, today in that region. Uh, when particular gentleman I talked with up in Box Elders said that they can grow more grain with less water than anyone in the world, just that they need that water, what little water they get at a specific time of year. And, uh, but that's today, back in, um, back in the 19th and early 20th century, dryland farming is just starting to, uh, to, to come about. As dryland farming techniques improved, the town witnessed its first major influx of people beginning in 1910. In the spring of that year, there were 33 claims filed in one day for plots of land in and around Box Elder. Businesses sprung up, and the Northern Pacific Railroad brought trains and opportunity through the heart of the burgeoning farm community. That's all I ever know is just the country life there. 
My dad was an international blockman. Whether that what brought him out here, I don't know. I don't remember that and all that. I think they come out in 1911. My dad was about 18 years old when he came to America. But my mom didn't come over until, I think it was 1906. And she came over just to marry my dad. Three families of us were close families in Norway, and then they came over here and homesteaded. So, and that was in the early 1890 or somewhere. I can't remember just when that was. Young people, I suppose, they decided, well, there's something in, in the new country. They're going to leave the old country and go to the new country. The building actually wasn't uh, completed until 1917, so the congregation met in various houses up until that point. But when they did complete the church, uh, particularly the bell tower, has some very uh, uh, strong indications uh, that it had a Norwegian identity or Scandinavian identity to the church. Uh, it, it is reminiscent of stave churches in post-medieval Norway and therefore probably uh, is an indication of their identity and the fact that it, it's very reminiscent of stave church uh, design uh, seems to it seems to indicate to me that, that they're really trying to project their identity as, as not only Lutherans but Norwegian and Scandinavian Lutherans particularly. It seems like we were, we were in high school here at Box Elder for four years. Well, in the, we all batched Helen and her older sister, and I batched the first year with a, a Grandma Erickson, all batched in another uh, building out of Box Elder here ways. There was no electricity or any inside plumbing or anything. It was really rustic. <laughs> We learned how to play basketball. Never even heard of it before we got to school, before we got to high school. We had a really good team one year. We didn't lose any games all year. So then the other uh, towns around came in and they started, would challenge us to a ball game. And we played Kremlin one time and we skunked them. <laughs> my mother and my dad, they, they seemed like they really knew what was important for us, us to learn and everything. And so when we got to be a certain age, why, they made it to they emphasize the fact that it was time to, at that time it was read for the minister, but it meant to go to confirmation and study. So that was really important in my family. I spoke my mother. I don't know whether she was a charter member here or not. She could have been. But uh, they no doubt started to shortly after they, whenever this was going here. They just only, we only lived three miles, four miles out of town here, so there was no, and that time you didn't have no means of transportation to travel any distance. So they just come here to church then. My mother was always, uh, Made sure I went to church all the time, and uh, always be, got to be dressed up. I didn't come in jeans or nothing like that. She she was real particular. When you go to church, you dress up. That's that's the way things were in those days. My favorite memories were usually Christmas Eve. They would usually put on a, a service that was kind of nice and light, and it told a refreshing story of giving and sharing, you know. And then, of course, when you've got, you know, at one time we had a pretty good Sunday school, and of course, Sunday school and little kids, that's, that's a special, special time at Christmas. Because it's so small and intimate, uh, you can be more informal. Uh, at each service, uh, you know, you could you know, joke about things, you could have people talk in the pews, and we'd have, meetings of the congregation, you know, right after church, no one would move, everyone would stay in the pews. So the informality was nice. Uh, because it was such a small group and they've known each other all their lives, um, it's like being a part of a family. 
first Saturday in December, Faith Lutheran had a bake sale. And uh, my first recollection of the bake sale was held in one of the elevators here. I'll tell you, people, they would stand out at the door waiting to come in. And nine o'clock was the, you know, that nobody could come and do anything. And our tables were lined up all the way down and all the way across and plumb full of big stuff from us ladies. And it was just unbelievable, the, the success that we you know, get from. And like I said, we, we uh, used mainly our funds that we got to, to donate back to, to the area. The one thing about the Box Elder Church is that they had a very long history of uh, charitable donations and they had their famed pancake breakfasts that uh, they would then take the money and disperse to uh, various charities or the quilting, uh, the quilts that were very famous and given to the Big Sandy Medical Center and, and the uh, uh, very famous apparently bake sales uh, where people would uh, line up for hours to get in and be the first to, uh, uh, to get some of the good baked goods and the goods for that were then donated to various charities as well. And uh, particularly before the Depression, churches were incredibly important in providing those types of social services to families that uh, fell on hard times, uh, uh, families whose main breadwinner uh, 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 was lost or, or hurt, and, and so churches uh, were, were much more uh, involved in, in providing charity, and an important charity because there really weren't any other options to a large degree. Elder here. In the history there, they used to have a bank here, they used to have a law office here. It, it's just unbelievable how things have changed here in Box Elder since I was confirmed. Because this used to be such a good town. We had a lot of activity and there was a lot of uh, people that socialized a lot with, with neighbors. And that's something that doesn't happen anymore. There's a lot of more rabble rousing and uh, drinking and that sort of thing that there never was. When there might, uh, there may have been when we were here, but we didn't ever know about it. And the, the Rocky Boy buildings have come so close. I mean, they're right next to the school here and on out, a lot of them. So they're, they're a little different class of people completely, but a lot of good ones. But you never hear about them, you only hear about the others. In the 50s, they encouraged the Indian kids to move away and to find a vocation off the reservation. Well, from the 60s to 70s, they started a slow migration back. And then, of course, when a lot of these families moved back, it wasn't just one of them moved back. They moved back with a wife and maybe five or six kids. Well, then they found a home farm on the reservation. And then from then on, there was a migration of a lot of those people come back all through the last 40 years, you see. Like I said, there's no, no not hardly any white people in the, in the town. But it's you know, all Native American and stuff. So, so you, like you said, you say you're from Box Elder. <laughs> And if, you know, somebody on the phone or something and they'll say, oh, are you Native American? I said, no, I'm not. When I come down here, I, I drove around this morning and I thought, gosh, that house is gone. Those houses that I remember, you know. Of course, they had a depot over here, railroad depot, and, and uh, that's gone. And I, I think, uh, like I say, they had a hospital here. And then uh, it seems like uh, seems like uh, time has a way of, of benefiting some places and, and destroying other places. And, and, and I certainly see it here in Box Order. Of course, maybe it's 
doing okay, but to me it's not the same as it was. Most people that I talk to in Box Elder uh, seem to agree that the town has really uh, begun to uh, decline. The number of people have gone. Uh, the demographics of it have changed as well. In a, a report from the Box Elder uh, Church to the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America in 2000, mentioned that the demographics are changing. At one point it was uh, a, a mostly European white community and is becoming increasing, increasingly Native American, um, though the congregation itself did not. If you drive through Box Elder today, Today you see uh, buildings that are abandoned uh, or in very bad repair. There are only three businesses left in Box Elder, uh, owned by one family, or three or four businesses left in Box Elder, three of which are owned by one family. The, the town is very typical of, of many small towns out on the plains that as transportation has advanced and you no longer need to be as close to services as, as you once did before, uh, there's, there's kind of a shift away from smaller towns to a little bit larger, uh, larger areas. And so uh, what you know once was being serviced in Box Elder, now people are, are seeking in Haver or Big Sandy. So it's a, it, it's, it's a town that is, is hanging on. It, it's trying to hang on, but um, it, it, it's not what it was back in you know, the 40s and 50s. Some business owners in the Box Elder community feel otherwise. Box Elder's a... I, uh, uh, it's kind of a little niche right in a, right a, surrounded by reservations, so business is good here as a rule. And it's, it's a good community. It's been a real good community. I didn't even know it really existed until <laughs> I came through. I was going to school at Northern when I moved over here, and I went back and, back and forth across to Lewistown and here many, many, many times. I didn't know this was such a booming little community. In fact, I'd never even stopped because really all I saw was bars, so I guess I wouldn't stop by myself. But yeah, then when we bought the DNL, it, it's been a good community. It's a nice community. One of the more positive changes to the Box Elder community has been in the development of its excellent school system. The school has about 400 students K through 12 and it's 97 percent Native American. And I think we had three Caucasian students and three foreign exchange students from Korea last year. It's also a school with a lot of free and reduced lunch and they were awarded with being the only school in the nation last year to achieve test scores that made them pass No Child Left Behind. I think the school benefits the community a lot because they're doing a lot of diabetes prevention. They start with healthy breakfast, lunch, snack during the day. They just put in a new million dollar fitness center that's open to teachers in the morning and then students who have a 3.0 or more right after school and then open to the entire community in the evenings. That's one of the steps. They're doing a lot of wellness programs, probably three or four times a year the community comes into the school and they receive awards or give certificates for coming and learning about health and fitness and how to better educate their children. Basketball is also a huge priority and so that motivates kids to learn and they want to have the grade point to play. I think the school is really trying to help the community. They do checks every morning. If students are in school, they call until they get an answer at home and ask where the children are. They'll go and pick them up. There's a great bus program. There's after school care. They do just about anything they can to help parents become better parents. The changes experienced in Box Elder are also representative of a much larger trend experienced in much of rural Montana over the last 50 years. As it has become more and more difficult to preserve a way of life on the Montana Plains, 
Population has steadily dwindled, and the people of eastern and central Montana have begun an exodus out of the region. Farms have gotten and ranches have gotten a lot bigger in Montana. People, uh, the land is owned by fewer and fewer people. And what is unfortunate is a lot of young people simply cannot afford to stay on the family farm. They cannot take over the burden of the, the taxation burden. If, if dad leaves the farm, dad dies and leaves the farm to son or daughter, they simply can't afford to stay. And farming is becoming simply more and more of a huge gamble for people that they're unwilling to take on, especially young people. And so what we're seeing is a continued out-migration of people in eastern Montana. And this is confirmed by the 2000 census in which between 1990 and 2000, we see the Montana population grow by about 9% overall from 800 and some thousand to a little over 900,000. However, it's deceiving. There were 24 counties out of 56 in Montana in the 2000 census that lost population between 1990 and 2000. 23 of them were in eastern Montana. So the out-migration of people in Montana is occurring in eastern Montana. Many uh, small communities in eastern Montana, and again, this isn't unique to eastern Montana, it's a condition shared in much of the West, uh, are losing their young people. Uh, very predictably, young people do not necessarily want to go in the ranching business or the farming business, and often because the families uh, are large enough, there aren't opportunities for every member of the family to survive doing what their fathers and mothers did before them. So part of the migration is simply kids uh, at the right age looking for jobs, looking for ways to survive. And you can't find much to support you anymore in eastern Montana. If you're going to survive, whether it's a small Montana town or somewhere else you have to accept the constancy of change as a major factor in your life. You definitely see, I think, um, a lack of optimism about the future in eastern Montana and northern Montana. I mean, it's when you just don't have any people anymore to make a go of it, there's no economic activity, economic diversity is at a standstill, and you know, all of those things that bind society together seem to start coming apart at the seams. And the family farm is quickly becoming a relic of the past. All throughout the life of Montana we've seen its boom and bust and we've seen shrinking agricultural areas and, and of course that's what this is a part of that uh, we're living in an area where once a once vital congregation there was a lot more people and uh, just a lot more folks that uh, that made up these congregations and as farms got bigger young people left the communities and the bigger towns were magnets for jobs and we didn't need as many people. Uh, congregations found it more and more difficult to operate. Declining membership is just what is the whole situation of it. And just gradually, gradually going down. And uh, the only ones that, well, older people who were supporting the church, see, they, and when they passed away and just feel warm. And, and yeah, there's been very few of the children coming to church here, so to keep it going. They moved away too, so. When I came, there were, oh, perhaps 10, 12 people a Sunday here. And then one of the prominent families moved away to Helena. And uh, just financially, it, was, it really wasn't possible for the congregation to continue to uh, you know, pay for uh, certain pastoral services. There was the Sundays when you'd come, and of the eight or 10 of us, there would be four of us, you know, 
well, you know, four plus the preacher, you know, that's kind of, that's a pretty skinny congregation. And it, it, it isn't, you know, it, it doesn't work. And financially, it was just running out. Well, we didn't want to do it, but we just got to the point there where we was having a hard time getting enough finances to meet the obligations. There, we're going to have to do something, that's all there's to it. And we had the bishop up here and talked to him, and you know, he, said, he understood the situation. He said, it's happening all over, he said, these small churches that just can't keep going. So, it's too bad, but there's nothing, nothing we can do about it. The way I first heard about uh, the closing of Faith Lutheran Church came through an email from uh, Bishop Almond. Uh, Bishop Almond, very good about uh, keeping all the folks in the Montana Senate informed of the, the life of the church. And, um, he had sent out an email asking uh, all of us across the state to hold the people of Faith Lutheran Church in, in our prayers as they had made the difficult decision to close their congregation. And then there was a PS at the end of the email that said um, if, um, if there's anyone out there that could use uh, pews or altar or lectern, uh, please call uh, Deanna Bits and listed a phone number and that's kind of where the whole journey started. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it because he said uh, he was asking, you know, what we had in the church that would be available for whatever he might need. And uh, then we just got to talking more and more, and he talked about a little, little white church. And I said, he said, does it have a steeple? I said, yes. And it has a bell. He said, does it have a bell? I said, yes, it has a bell, and it has two different, two different um, Oops. chimes or whatever, you know. And, and so he said, uh, you know, he said, um, don't, don't do anything yet about the church, he said. Uh, let me talk to some, some of the directors or somebody. He said, I'll call you back in a half an hour, and I thought, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, we were very doubtful until, you know, for, for quite some time that it was true and stuff. In fact, I think we still have a few members that say, well, I don't believe it till I see it being moved. So everybody was kind of, you know, what are we going to do with this church? What are we going to do with it? We can't leave it here. What are we going to do? Where are we going to put it? Are we going to sell it or what? And I could come in and say, hey, I have this guy on the phone that says don't sell the church. And then he calls back at a half an hour and says, we'll be down to look at it. Not only says don't sell it, but yeah. he's just ecstatic and giddy and full of energy about it. And, I mean, to convince anyone that it's possible to move this church or feasible or even worthwhile, mm -hmm. you know. It takes someone with a lot of energy and guesses. And I mm -hmm. said, and so she says, well, you know, we need to meet you. You know, like, who is this slick car salesman from Billings, <laughs> Montana, anyway? She didn't say that, but I, I know that's what she was thinking. And, uh, and uh, she, uh, I said, uh, she said, well, we need to meet you, and you need to come up and see the church. And I said, well, I just, oh, boy, I got everything I need in life but time. My wife was actually over in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, over the 4th of July. Her mother had had some surgery, and she was there taking care of her. And I knew I was going to be there coming back to Billings on Monday, the 4th of July. So as I left Coeur d'Alene, I said, you know, what, I'll, what I can do is when I get on the interstate, wherever the right place, I'll just head north. And then I'll come up to Box Elder and meet you and, and look at the church. And, and she was thoughtful and quiet for a minute. And then she told me, she says, that's not going to work. <laughs> I, I said, why? And she said, uh, she said, well, one of the four families is going to be gone. And I thought, so? <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll meet the other three. Oh, no, she said, you need to, we all need to meet you. And then it kind of dawned on me. This was like an open adoption. I, I feel that a part of me kind of belongs to this church because my parents were so influential in seeing that it got built and helping pay for it. And, and all the, the socials that they had to get together and, and uh, so they could uh, make a little bit of money to kind of help pay for the church and stuff here. 
And uh, so I, I just feel like it's, it's part of, part of the community and really I was so happy to hear that it was going to be moved and uh, that way it'll be preserved. Moving the church would prove a Herculean accomplishment for the people of Faith Lutheran and for St. John's Lutheran Ministries. The church would have to be lifted from its foundations and travel over 275 miles across rugged, winding terrain on two-lane highways and dirt roads. This trip would cost St. John's over $86,000, part of which was raised by members of the church and another large part of it was raised by thriving financial for Lutherans. In the summer of 2006, Kent Burgess and St. John's were able to find one man up to the challenge, Dwayne Ostermiller of Billings. This was just an ordinary job. It wasn't any harder than uh, any of the rest of them as this type of building. There's quite a few hours goes into uh, loading it, uh, rolling it off of the hole and then loading it onto the wheels. There's several hours of men, hours going into that. <laughs> then we're ready for the road. Thrivent Financial for Lutherans donated 30000 and this was a matching grant, so we needed to raise another 30000 in order to receive all of it. So basically, the goal was 60000 I think we're pretty close to that. Uh, what we wanted people to do was to donate a um, hundred bucks for every mile to, between here and Billings and it's about 270 some miles. We're going to have power lines and phone lines and, and on and on all the way through the trip. That's part of the, uh, that's probably the largest part of the cost is paying for those crews that will be moving those lines all the way. And so you have many different companies that are involved. You have Triangle Telephone, you have Northwest Energy, on and on and uh, yeah you're gonna see there's apparently 50 of them between here and Big Sandy in a 10 mile stretch so this is gonna be kind of the part that slows it down the most um, and there'll be a lot of that when we get into Billings on the north side
The church left Box Elder on September 12, 2006. Rain delays slowed the arduous journey considerably, but the Little White Church finally arrived in Billings on October 4th. The church now rests upon a new foundation in the middle of an open field where St. John's Lutheran and Atonement Lutheran Church plan to build their future projects. Our complex will be up over in here. Uh, there'll be a kind of a courtyard area connected with parking lots in this area here with the uh, little church, um, kind of facing over toward ours. And then that goes right into the senior housing project that uh, the church does will be connected right behind this. Now that the church has made its journey across the back roads of Montana, there is still much work to be done in order to complete its restoration. Burgess estimates it will take at least another $100,000 to complete the project and properly restore the church. But on the, on the old church, what we'll do now that after it gets placed over the hole is uh, we'll go ahead and start the construction in the basement and getting all of that done. Uh, steeple has, needs quite a bit of renovation, so that'll be done. Probably will not be completed till spring and then set back up on the church. This is much like Town Square out of St. John's. This is where a lot of major activities kind of generate get a nice gathering spot and just a focal point to, you know, for people of faith together and it'll, uh, it's just a neat concept the whole thing. In some ways what's interesting is that it's, it's somewhat allegorical uh, the move to St. John's uh, campus up in the Heights where you know a church in some ways has a lifespan you know it was born it lived its life it did it served a purpose it was a productive member of the community and you know now in its golden years it's moving to a retirement home. You know, I mean, there's a certain irony to that. I'm originally from Box Eller, and when I was 1939, when I was four years old, I was baptized in that church, and in uh, 1950, it confirmed. So then I came to Billings in the 50s and been here ever since, and it's unbelievable that that thing's going to be only two miles away from me where I'm living here in town. I, I just uh, am happy to, to see that, it, that uh, it's going to go to, to a place that will be used, you know, in, in the same situation that we used it, you know, to, to worship in, to have weddings in. And uh, I'm just very, very happy to see this happen to the church. So anyway, it's, it's going to be a happy landing for this church, and it just makes me happy too. As the dawn breaks in the new year of 2007, for the church building of Faith Lutheran, a new chapter in its odyssey as a place of worship begins. Once on the brink of abandonment and possibly destruction, the words of Psalm 102 may have seemed appropriate. Hear my prayer, O Lord, for my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. I am like a lonely bird on the housetop. My days are like an evening shadow. In the end, there are three odysseys that the Faith Lutheran Church building has endured. The first was to shepherd and nurture the Lutheran congregation of Box Elder. That journey ended in October of 2005. The physical journey of the building from Box Elder to Billings was its second odyssey, which allowed it to begin its third, a renewed place of worship for the people of St. John's new retirement community in Billings. The first immigrants who began this church on the open Montana plains had a dream. That dream has taken on a life of its own, and that dream has been revitalized by the second chance it has been given. This is not merely the story of a church being moved, but the story of a people's faith in motion, the story of a people's history that is not dead and gone, but that is very much alive today. <laughs>